This is Battery Townsley in the Marin Headlands, a little bit north of San Francisco. It was the happy home of about 150 soldiers who serviced two 16-inch rifles. The story began in the late 1920s, it was decided to upgrade the defenses of San Francisco Harbor with a twin-gun battery north and south mounting the 16-inchers. The Army chose this hill because uh, the, the old expression, location, location, location. This was a high promontory overlooking a huge area of water on the coast. The guns at their extreme right traverse could fire all the way up towards Point Reyes and the huge uh, potential landing beaches at Drake's Beach. On the south, they could fire all the way down along the San Francisco coastline. This had a huge a strategic value. Battery Townsley is located north of San Francisco on the hill above Tennessee Point. Years under construction, 1937 to 1940. Length, about 180 meters. Elevation above sea level, 127 meters. The battery's fortifications were built to withstand direct hits from aerial bombs and a battleship's shells. They consisted of a layer of reinforced concrete from two and a half to three meters thick, covered with a six meter layer of topsoil. The distance between gun emplacements was almost 107 meters. Battery Townsley was armed with two 406 mm naval Mark II Mod 1 guns. In this casemate, which has been filled in since the war, would be found a single 16-inch rifle. That rifle would be protected by a large shield. On one side of the shield would be the crew of approximately 50 people required to service the weapon. On the other side of the shield, it's a beautiful view of the Pacific Ocean with nothing between you and Hawaii. The guns were mounted with a, an arc of traverse of about 170 degrees. This will give you a range of fire that you could hit targets along the coast 25 miles to the north or the south. It's no coincidence that 406 mm artillery appeared at Battery Townsley and other similar fortifications. After signing the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922, the United States cancelled construction of battleships and all the guns manufactured to date were transferred to ground forces. On July the 1st, 1940, the number one gun from Battery Townsley fired a training round. It was the first shot ever from a 406 mm gun mounted in the Coast Battery. Uh, target practice ranges routinely in the vicinity of 18 miles out at sea. The target was a, uh, a towed sled, a little barge, about 30 feet long with a white sail on it. They could generally hit that moving target on the third shot. First shot was usually over, second shot under, third one, you could hit the target. When you consider a 30 foot long target as compared to an 800 foot long battleship, that's good shooting. The only catch to constructing on this site was it's not rock. Not rock like we would think of, where you're solid and you can tunnel through it. This is a very brittle type of rock. There's actually a 600 foot long reinforced concrete building underneath this hill. It was constructed in the open. And then after the concrete had cured, this spoil that had been cut away was backfilled, the land was recontoured, and then it was planted with native vegetation to make it look like a natural appearing hillside. So of course there's a lot more to a gun battery than simply the visible two guns. Underneath the surface is an entire complex. So let's have a look inside and see what we got. The 
The underground rooms of the battery house generators, air conditioning systems and the main storage. Separate ammunition magazines were located in the tunnels connecting the gun casemates. Each gun had two projectile magazines. Each magazine would have 50 rounds. They came in two types of battery towns. They black with white markings for practice rounds and yellow with black markings for service armor piercing. There was no high explosive issued. Of course, each one weighs the better part of a ton. To get them around the battery, you have a hoist system on rails. This works just like on a battleship. And because of the weight, the gearing ratio on these hoists is ridiculous. Watch what happens as I pull. In addition to the two projectile magazines, each gun also had two powder magazines. There will be 150 of these cans in each one. Each can would contain two projectile charges, each weighing about 110 pounds. To open, it's actually sealed. You rotate a little bit and then lift straight up. Hermetic. You pull out the two charges. They then got put onto a powder cart and sent to the guns. From the moment the battery entered service, gun crews were put through exhausting drills, target tracking, fire coordination and handling complex machinery in enclosed spaces. These drills were conducted under different conditions. Normal environment, under heavy rain, in total darkness without electricity, and without any officers to issue commands. When the war started, the battery's personnel were put on a full combat alert status. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, the US military command did not know where the Japanese attack task force would go next. Los Angeles and San Francisco could easily become the next targets. Throughout World War II, up to 150 artillerymen lived inside the battery on a five-minute alert notice, meaning from the time the alert was sounded, you had five minutes to the time when you were ready to fire around. Because this battery was such a critical piece in the harbor defenses of San Francisco. It was uh, for almost three years at the highest level of readiness. Given that we're a fair way up the hill from the barracks, it made a lot more sense given the rapid response requirement to simply accommodate the soldiers at the battery. To do this, they mounted these racks on the tunnel walls. Now, given the noise in here from the generators, the foot traffic and the echo effect, I'd argue it was probably a good idea to simply take a mattress and sleep outside. Soldiers who were assigned here, they remember living inside the tunnels beneath the artificial earth hill, being only allowed outside uh, when they were on uh, fatigue duty or when they had reveille to smoke. No smoking inside, of course. Otherwise, they were uh, confined to the interior of the battery, where they said the lights were too dim to read and too bright to sleep. The 406 mm batteries became the backbone of the US's harbor defenses. However, they weren't the only ones. San Francisco's defense consisted of a whole complex of fortifications. So now we're crossing over to the other side of the Golden Gate on, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge, icon of San Francisco. Uh, the batteries will be found, uh, a lot of them on both sides. So on the north side is the Marin Headlands, the south side was the Presidio with the large army facility. San Francisco's coastal defense system consisted of several military installations hosting over 30 artillery batteries with guns of calibers ranging from 76 to 406 millimeters. In addition to the artillery, an extensive network of command posts for the coastal defenses was created that controlled, amongst other things, mine barriers blocking the harbor's entrance 
and stretching out in a 5 km radius from the San Francisco coast. The main objective of the large caliber artillery at Townsley and Davis was to engage enemy battleships. While 152mm guns at Bathory's Rathbone Mackindo or Chamberlain were charged with firing upon enemy landing ships on approach to the coastline and destroying minesweepers attempting to clear the mines. We are now just yards from Baker Beach, that popular recreation point. This is Battery Chamberlain, the last of a series of forts built between the late 1890s and the mid 1900s. Battery Chamberlain was built uh, over about a year in 1904 and completed in 1905 and mounted four of the disappearing guns and it was actually the last gun battery built in the Presidio. But this one, Battery Chamberlain, had four six-inch guns. So these are on the small side. They were actually meant for close-in defenses. Of all the artillery installations around San Francisco, only Battery Chamberlain had 152mm guns mounted on M1903 disappearing carriages. Barrel length, 50 calibers. Range, almost 13,400 meters. Gun weight, over nine tons. Shell weight, 49 kilograms. Gun crew, 22 personnel, 13 of which operated the gun and nine brought ammunition from the magazines. The idea here is that it's, it's a powerful gun, but during the time it takes to load and aim it, it's invisible to the enemy. It's pointing right at the wall. The crew here is at, behind the wall, uh, the, the parapet of the battery, and in 30 seconds they can load, they can aim, set the range and, and the azimuth, and be ready to hit a target. San Francisco's batteries protected the city until the end of World War II, and the whole defense system was thought through in minute detail. By the end of the war, demonstrated to be unnecessary because naval attack was extremely unlikely as compared with air attack. So uh, 1945 was when the guns were um, inactivated and unmanned. San Francisco was never attacked. Neither Battery Townsley or any of the other several dozen fortifications ever actually engaged an enemy. After World War II, Battery Townsley was mothballed and used as military storage until the end of 1948. In the 1960s, the Battery's rooms were repurposed for testing military equipment. And finally, in 1984, the Battery was closed for good. 23 years later, it was reopened to allow everybody to learn about the life and service of men who defended San Francisco at Townsley and the other artillery batteries. San Francisco has always been a very important harbor. Indeed, in the late 19th century, a survey showed that it was second only behind New York Harbor. As a result, Chamberlain and Townsley are only two of the many batteries which have defended the Golden Gate over the years.